In some versions of this same passage, it has been translated as, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have died. It is a natural course of life that we grieve. The loss, we grieve the loss of a fellow human being, especially when we would have shared a very close relationship with that person. Today is no different almost 2,000 years ago from when the Apostle Paul penned these words of our text to the church at Thessalonica. Paul wrote to a group of Christians who had just come to faith in Christ and who were slowly turning away from their pagan ways. It was rather difficult for them to grasp the hope of being reconciled with loved ones as was being presented by Paul. The Thessalonian Christians were very much accustomed to and accepted that death was a final and done deal. That at death, there was a cloud of finality of all forms of existence. But Paul was advancing the hope and the doctrine of resurrection. That in the final analysis, just as Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so too will all who have died in Christ, they too shall rise from the dead. And so the Thessalonian Christians could look forward to being reunited with their loved ones. And so with this thought, with this hope and assurance in mind, Paul wanted the Christians there to grieve in such a way that they lived in great anticipation of what is to come, rather than living in despair, misery, and gloom. But what must occupy our attention in reading this verse or passage surrounding this verse is that Paul was referring to persons who have died in Christ. This hope, this anticipation and expectation had its roots grounded in Christians who had acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and died with hope of eternal life in God's kingdom. Therefore, those who were left behind were encouraged not to grieve as they did in the former pagan life, but to look forward to life beyond the grave. And that is a message of hope that I give to you today, Sheila, Adrian, Dion, Chalice, all the siblings and all the rest of the family of our brother Simeon. I say, do not grieve without hope. Do not settle into a sense of despair that all is lost because he's not around anymore. For even though you and I cannot know for absolutely certain because only God knows by the words and the actions that Simeon himself displayed way ahead of his death and even shortly before he signaled to all that he was dying in Christ. He spoke 
of his own personal hope. And he opened up about his faith and his desire. And that showed a sense of purpose and certainly a hope that indicated that we should not grieve as the pagans. That you, Sheila, and all the others, you should not grieve as the pagans. And I personally recall ministering to him in the last weeks especially, and last hours too. And in speaking to him, praying for him, and even administering the blessed sacrament, he would open up. And when he made his own confession, and I pronounced absolution, his face lit up as if he knew that all was well. But what if Paul, my brothers and sisters, was to write to the church here in this federation? Or more so, what if Paul was to write to the church here on Nevis? What if Paul was to write to the modern church in today's world after close examination? Would he be writing to a people who, after reading his letter to the Thessalonians, which was written thousands of years ago, and who, after the benefit of scripture and the experiences of the church, would Paul be writing to a people who can boast of hope? Or would he admit that many of us are quite uninformed or ignorant to what the future holds for us? Because you see, the modern world is in such a state. Indeed, even the church is in such a state that we cannot be certain about so many of us. It's difficult to tell. For in the church, there are people from all walks of life, including the two main areas that dominated most of the life of our deceased brother. That is politics and law. And the reality is that we just don't know. The manner in which these two areas are lived and practiced create a plethora of doubts about the spirituality and the afterlife expectancy of many persons in and outside the church. It is no secret. And let me tell you all something. Whatever I'm going to say, I say it boldly. It is no secret that politics has been dominating the lives of the majority of Kittitians and divisions for quite some years now. There are too many of us who are willing, quite willing, to put God and his church aside and actively involve themselves in political activities at a moment's notice. In fact, the energies, the commitment, and the loyalty that many citizens, including church members, put into politics are seriously compromising their spiritual readiness and so in fact will leave doubts and ignorance at their passing. And while nothing is wrong with politics, and we know that, nothing is wrong with politics, but it is the way in which it is approached and engaged in especially here in our federation, that leaves a great deal to be desired. And more so in the area of spirituality. 
We have allowed politics to become so divisive and confrontational that battle lines are always drawn. People size you up by the colors you wear. I remember some years ago, well, when I came in in 2004, I think it was 2005 actually, the next year, green was the color for the season of Epiphany. And I had on a green chasuble. And one woman said to, one of my members said to a group of persons, See, you tell you so you're NRP. <laughs> People size you up by the colors you wear, regardless of the design or the nature of the clothing. People are hired, transferred, denied advancement, and sometimes threatened by reasons of their allegiance. And one of the things that I have noticed when it comes to allegiance is that for years now, there is actually no discipline, loyal and loyalty in our civil service, all because of politics. I repeat again, anything that I say here, I say it boldly and with every intention. Employees work according to their loyalties in the civil service. When your party is in government, you go to work anytime. You take off anytime and as much as you want. And you treat people anyhow, especially with disrespect. Why? Because your party is in, and I use the word guardedly, I'm going to come back to it, is in power. On the other hand, there are some employees who would openly refuse to work. They would disrespect their supervisors and they would give out confidential information and do everything to embarrass the government of the day. Why? Because their party is not in power. And the sad thing about this is that many of these same persons are the very same ones who would on Sunday after Sunday, Saturday after Saturday, sing and clap and shout and go on with all kinds of things in the house of God. Same persons! These are the same persons who claim to love God so much, who claim to be saved and sanctified. But yet, they would down their spiritual arms for the sake of politics and politicians. The same persons who would curse, insult, and deny their pastors and church leaders if they dare to oppose or challenge their political leaders. I don't know if I'm going to get the same comment, but there's so many times that I've been told that I'm going to be deported. Thank God, I'm from Newton Gown. Can't be deported. There are persons in our churches, persons who hold good positions in our churches, whatever denomination, who would never ever stand up to their political leaders for planning functions and activities on Saturdays and Sundays that would compete with worship services and other church functions. They can't do it. Afraid. In fact, they would prefer to see the churches empty and the political functions full to capacity and overflowing. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, Paul would have a very serious difficulty in writing to many of our churches in this modern day. And that is why there is so much doubt and confusion because we continue to compromise too much with the word of God and our loyalty to God are concerned. We compromise too much. 
That is why there's so much doubt, so much confusion and certainty at the time of some people's death. But what about politicians themselves? You can't say for it well because I have friends on all sides. And if they feel it, I'm throwing words in them, good and well, do better. <laughs> what about politicians themselves? We have seen some awful behavior and heard some dreadful and un unpleasant rhetoric coming from many of our politicians. Indeed, there is a serious challenge in the area of vocabulary and perhaps, perhaps, that is why, that is what is causing so much problems here in our little federation and the world at large. You know that word I said I was coming back to? Power? Hmm? There is that warlike, you know, war, if you like, to get into power or to stay in power. And that's the trouble with us today. We need to change our vocabulary. It should be in office or government, not power. Power belongs to God. Not no man, no government. Not at all. It is the failure to use appropriate words and phrases that cause us to lose focus and thus we apply the wrong tactics and strategies. And as we do, the wrong message is therefore sent to supporters and activists. You tell me if that's not true. And we need to change. And we need to challenge our politicians here in this federation, no matter who they are. Now, I've often advanced that every single politician in St. Kitts and Nevis, and we know them, every single one of them is a member of some church and some denomination. And this association must therefore influence their thoughts, their actions, and their intentions. So you ought to tell me, after you enter politics, you forget that you're a Christian or were a Christian? When our politicians sit in cabinet, sit in the caucuses of the various parties or convention or any similar situation, their spirituality must take priority and so persuade them to seek to do right by God and his people. But politics seem to make some very strange bedfellows or somehow alter and or damage the minds of some of our politicians. In office, they take an oath to do right by all and sundry. But no sooner some of them put down that Bible or put down their hand, the crusade begins. In opposition, all the wrongs are criticized and all the answers are presented. But behind closed doors, plans are afoot as to how to rearrange the civil service by putting cronies and activities in key positions and to wage another crusade. And so when death comes, even to some politicians, people wonder. Well, I know she, I know he will do so much bad. He can't see God face at all. How often we've heard that. People wonder because they would have created doubts and uncertainties. Now what about the law? Legal practitioners also from all angles. What about you? I choose not to say anything about the police force. <laughs> that would take me all afternoon and into the night. That is an institution that has been plagued for ever since with political interference. 
from all angles. It's sad. But I choose not to say anything. Suffice it to say, and this comes from me, Alwick Francis. Suffice it to say that one of these days, we may wake up and find that we do not have a police force at all. And I am willing to defend this comment at any forum. Brothers and sisters, Simeon Daniel practiced law as a lawyer, and so we must pay attention to those learned persons. The legal profession is one that is regarded with pride and dignity. Its practitioners are expected to conduct themselves with a certain decorum. And I, for one, have great respect for these learned persons. The trouble is that far too many of them are leaving us with great doubts as to their commitment to their oaths and other commitments. It would seem that financial gain is an absolute priority for many of them. Thank God not all. And such persons would do anything to gain quick ascension. I recall the days when lawyers would refuse cases on the merit that it would be rather offenses, offensive to the society to mount a dishonest defense under the circumstances of the case. But what? We get in pay anyway. Whether he or she is convicted, I am going to get paid. So even if it is dishonest to raise certain defense, I'll do it anyway. Now while every single person deserves a fair and honest opportunity, there are too many lawyers who would engage in wasting time and effort simply to line their pockets or to get fame. We don't have any inside here, do we? <laughs> don't lie. Don't lie at all. I also recall the days when lawyers would work on behalf of clients because they believed in the right and just causes. Sometimes at the end of the day, the payment was a cow or a sheep or something of that nature. And the thrill of having sought and obtained justice brought greater satisfaction than the remittance. But alas, today the majority of lawyers will not touch a matter at all unless they can relax comfortably on the charges levied. It's sad in some areas. I must add here though, that experience has been a teacher for some lawyers. And that is quite true. You take out a matter, the person promised to pay at the end of the case or in the next week or something like that, and some of them never come back, especially if they get convicted and go to jail. They can't pay you. But we must remember that lawyers too have commitments. And this must be borne in mind. But things have changed. People have changed and circumstances have changed. In many corners of the world and right here in this federation, many lawyers will accept matters on the condition of one's politics. See, the two of them come back to play. Many lawyers would gladly take a matter if the client is on their political side of the fence. But if you dare to challenge their side, there are suddenly all kinds of excuses why such a, such a matter seems weak and untenable. One such example again is politics. You would find lawyers from opposing sides willing to challenge the other. You'd have lawyers from the opposite side gladly take a case against the other side. You know it happens with government and opposition too. 
Opposition lawyers are glad to take a case to challenge the government, man, because it's going to give them mileage. And those lawyers who are sympathetic to the government would not dare touch certain matters. Crazy boy, you can't go and embarrass my government. That right here in St. Kitts and Nevis is a glaring fact. And such hypocrisy certainly leaves more to be desired. And it ultimately creates doubt and uncertainty. And brothers and sisters in Christ, our world needs persons who will stand their ground when it comes to faith in God. Too often fingers can be pointed to too many of us as we seem to separate our spiritual lives from our professions or our lives outside the church. We are very saintly in church. But don't tell me about Christianity or church on the outside. What makes us confident of our hope and helps us to dispel all uncertainty is consistency. Who I am here must be the person I am over here. It is the lack of visible consistency that causes others and more so our loved ones to doubt being united with us in the hereafter. Because of the indecisive spiritual or so-called spiritual lives that many of us live, that others are not impressed, they're not convinced that all is well with our souls. And so they may grieve with sadness and trepidation. Don't fool yourself. There's some others, some persons, it's convenient for them to think of some of us as not being genuine. When we are indeed genuine, they find all kind of excuses to support their point. But it is up to us, left up to us, to prove, to seek to live as much as possible to show others that it is well with our souls. Then, and only then, we can face death bravely. The story is told about a middle-aged woman who sought to cheat death. She went and she had, she was getting old in age, getting on in age, and she went and she got a facelift. And then she went to her priest. He said, Father, do you recognize me? Father said, who are you, sister? Don't you recognize me, Father? She said, no. Could you help me tell me who you are? Say, well, Father, if you don't recognize me, if the man of God don't recognize her, then death not going to recognize me when it comes. <laughs> you see, there are many of us who are seeking to do things to guise ourselves and to hide from the true us. Not so with God. God knows the very secrets of our heart. Friends, brothers and sisters, Sim, as we know him, is God. He's beyond our reach, beyond our physical reach. And the state of his soul is in the hands of God at this point. But what about you and me? What spiritual state are we in? Are we solidly and firmly planted, rooted in Almighty God, so that if death should come to us right now, we can say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Or when others ask, when we look ahead, we shall say, forever with the Lord. Amen. So let it be. If you and I, brothers and sisters, were to die right now, right here and now, and there's some of us who are very scared in hearing me say that, they have unfinished business. What if we were to die right here and now? 
how would others mourn our loss? Would they feel confident that we are safe in the arms of Jesus? Or would they grieve in pain and anguish because they are ignorant of our spiritual standing? Let me say to each of us, brothers and sisters, that none of us hold the future in our hands. None of us knows the future. So therefore, which of us is next? Who's next? Do we know which of us today here will face death next? And since we do not know, what are our plans? A friend said to me a few days ago, just a few days ago, in a conversation he said to me, it seems as if there's a cloud of death hanging over the Federation and more so here in Nevis. He went on, he said, look at the number of persons who have died in the last two weeks. And the young people too. And he began looking at some of the persons. He named them. And he mentioned their age. What if that is true, brothers and sisters? That a cloud of death is hanging over us. Are we frightened? What if you and I should be next? What if it is me, you, 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 or you? What if you should die next? Which one of us is certain that we will get, we will not get into a vehicular accident right after this service and pass? That's reality. Or what about the heart attack? Electrocution? Or even any other unforeseen accident? What then? How will others mourn our loss? Would they be uncertain as to our future beyond the grave? We can dispel all doubts, fears, and anxieties. You and I can put all fears and uncertainties to rest. And all that we need to do, if we haven't as yet, is to ensure that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And that we acknowledge him as Savior. And live this with confidence as we prepare for our own impending departure and when we do someone would be able to say to those whom we have left behind brothers and sisters we do not want you to be uninformed about my loved one who has died because it is well it is well with this soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.